everybody. This is a recap of the lost lesson of September the, um, what day was that? Is that the 9th, the 10th? This past Sunday, um, that was the 10th. And apologies to those who tried to log in and couldn't, um, uh, got locked out of Zoom that morning because I had changed the password and had forgotten it. Um, obviously I'm back in now. So my apologies to those who were counting on Zoom and were not able to join us. Um, so I wanted to do a little recap of the lesson and uh, including for those who, who um, join us simply through the recordings after the fact. So we're gonna start out with, um, with the wonderful Bible Jeopardy review that Cedric created for us. So let me get that up on the screen for us. So give me just a moment here to screen share. So looky here, we have um, we have Bible Jeopardy, and um, Cedric got this template off of that wacky World Wide Web, and this is going to let us um, review some of the things that we studied a few uh, for the last few weeks, where Luke introduces his themes for his magnum opus the book of Luke Acts, the, the two volume work of Luke Acts. And, and we looked at how the first two chapters of the book introduce um, these themes, how we can learn some things about the composition of the book, about the historical setting of the book. And so Cedric had the really great idea to review this with a Bible excuse me, a Bible Jeopardy. So he even had the music to play. So I'll just go da, 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 da. So here we have our four, four topics, three questions under each topic. So not the full, um, full-blown Alex Trebek um, experience, but a little mini Jeopardy. So we'll just go through these together. And you want to think about the topic as your clue to what we're getting into with the question. And for those who weren't with us um, um, for the, the Christmas in August series, you might want to go back and watch that because it's going to really give you an introduction to the things that Luke introduces in his first two chapters that really come back again and again throughout throughout um, his his writing. So let's start with women in Luke. Women play uh, a much greater role in Luke's gospel than in any of the other gospels. So let's start let's start with women in Luke for two hundred. This prophetess was always in the temple looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And of course, that was Anna. Uh, Anna, remember when Jesus is presented in the temple, uh, Anna and Simeon are there. So Anna. So let's go to women for 400. She sang a prayer the church calls the Magnificat. You remember who that is? Of course, that is Mary, Magnificat. My soul magnifies uh, the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That beautiful, beautiful prayer uh, that, that Mary sings. It's really a song uh, in, uh, in the first chapter of Luke. And then last of all, women for 600, she was advanced in years and barren. She is the only woman in the Bible called righteous. Oh my goodness, who is that? That is Elizabeth. And for those who wonder, where did I get this business about righteous? Um, it's chapter one, verse six, speaking of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And she is actually the only woman in scripture to be referred to as righteous. 
Let's go to authorship. Hmm. Okay, let's think about, about, about authorship of this book. For 200, this most excellent one was the recipient of Luke Acts and may have been the author's patron. And of course, that is, right, you got it, Theophilus, right? Um, uh, Luke says in the first chapter, uh, first verse, in, um, uh, in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth. And, and actually a better translation there is certainty or have assurance uh, concerning the things of which you have been informed. So Theophilus, Greek name, excellent. He's referred to as excellent, so he may have a government position. Um, he's uh, a Gentile, and he has some familiarity with the Jesus movement and probably is a God-fearer. Somebody, um, the term is applied to Gentiles who are very interested in Judaism and, and have not always become Jewish except not having been circumcised. So let's go to authorship for 400. Traditionally credited with writing the third gospel, this position traveled with Paul. And of course, that's, oops, not sure why that happened. Uh, um, okay, it's lost his mind. Uh, of course, that was Luke. So we're having technical difficulties. This is par for the course. So Luke, um, Paul mentions uh, in three places in his letters as being with him and refers to him as a physician. Some people think that Paul may have had some sort of chronic illness that required a physician to, to travel with him. We don't know. Authorship for 600. This single two-volume work was composed by one author and comprises one quarter of the New Testament. And of course, that is Luke Acts. Luke, right? I just read to you um, in those first four verses, he establishes um, uh, we see that it is written to someone named Theophilus. And if you go over to Acts, very first line, first chapter, first verse. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So Acts is the second volume of this two-volume series written by the same author. Traditionally, we believe that that is Luke. Uh, the physician who traveled with Paul, and it's written to the same person, Theophilus. And it is one quarter of the New Testament. Sources. Luke, Luke clearly says that he is familiar with other writings about it, right? In chapter one of Luke, um, he, he mentions um, that, that um, it, it seemed good to me also to write an orderly account. And he talks about in the first verse, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us. He is familiar with other narratives. He says so right there. Other narratives about the life of Jesus. He has other sources in front of them. And he uses, it's plural. He has multiple sources in front of him. So it just begs the question, what were they? So for 200 sources, for 200, what other gospel did Luke use to create his narrative spine for his own gospel? At this point, you kind of have to take my word for it but we've talked about this and, and many scholars call it a narrative spine. In other words, it creates a framework around which Luke builds the narrative. He takes the same sort of narrative chronology and then builds out his narrative from there. And it is the gospel of Mark. I don't know what's happened to my answers. Um, so, so it's the gospel of Mark. Um, he does not seem to have um, he does not have John in front of him. He does not have Matthew in front of him, we don't think, but he definitely has Mark in front of him. So now sources for 400. What other source? 
These sayings by Jesus appear in Matthew and in Luke, but not in Mark. Sayings. So there's there's a whole bunch of sayings that are not in the Gospel of Mark, but they appear in Luke and they appear in Matthew, not in the same order. And scholars give that a name. They call it Q. All of those combined together, they call Q, which is the first letter of the German word for source. Nobody's ever found this document. We don't even know if there was a document or if it was just oral tradition. Jesus said this, and Jesus said that. There is one exception. There is one bit of narrative in it, and we'll actually look at that today. But this is called Q, and it is those sayings that Matthew and Luke both have, but that never appear in Mark. So it's a second source. And lastly, sources for 600. This material occurs only in Luke. And there's actually a name that scholars give to this material. It's not in Mark. It's not in Matthew. It's, it's unique to Luke. It only appears in Luke. And the name that scholars give to that is special Luke. There's also special Matthew, things that occur in Matthew that don't occur anywhere else. And for both of them, their nativity stories are among uh, those special materials. So, um, so those who, who, who said the nativity, um, that's a good example of material that comes out of what scholars call special Luke. Other examples that we're going to see throughout the book, some of the parables, for example, um, the parable of the prodigal son, for example, it only appears in Luke. Uh, quite a number of parables only appear in Luke. So they're all part of what we call special Luke. So that's three sources. That's Mark, that's Q, and that's special Luke. And lastly, let's look at themes. For 200, Luke is supremely concerned to show God's faithfulness to these people. And that, of course, is the children of, of Abraham, the children of Israel, uh, the Hebrew people, um, the chosen people. That is absolutely a supreme theme for Luke that he wants to show. And we talked about one of the reasons for the concern over that theme may be because um, Theophilus, clearly a Gentile, may be thinking, well, this is great. Gentiles are now included in this saving plan. But by the time Luke is writing, right, Acts, the things in Acts have already happened. We're well into the ministry of the church, and it is looking like the ministry, the proclamation to the Jews is not going well, uh, that they are not uh, embracing the message as, as ubiquitously, as universally, and wholeheartedly as one would hope. And so the question then is, well, if they're not answering the call, well, wait a minute. Is God being faithful to them? After all, the temple has been destroyed. They're living di in diaspora, spread out through the Roman Empire, and they, they're not coming to this message. So has God been faithful to them? And if God has not been faithful to them, well, is God going to be faithful to me and to the other Gentiles that he's bringing in now? Um, and Luke is supremely concerned to answer that question by saying God has been completely faithful to his promises and to his people, and that that faithfulness extends to and through the church. Let's go to themes for 400. Jesus will follow in this tradition indicated by allusions to Samuel and Elijah and that is the prophetic tradition. Jesus is very much so a prophetic Messiah in the book of um, the third gospel, uh, the, the, the gospel according to Luke, a prophetic Messiah. And lastly, themes for 600, the prophets foretold and Jesus' ministry shows that they were always included in God's saving plan, and that is the Gentiles. Luke really does want to show that the inclusion of the Gentiles has always been part of God's 
plan. And he does that by reminding us, uh, even as early as the infancy narratives, that the prophets themselves foretold it, and Jesus' ministry is going to continue to show that and to actualize the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's saving plan. And of course, the book of Acts is going to carry that even further. So, Jeopardy. Um, good job, everybody. So now we're going to turn to today's passage, and um, I hope you have a handout. Um, we're looking at Luke chapter 3, verse 1, through Luke chapter 14, verse 13. And uh, you'll also want to have with you um, the handy-dandy chart that has all of our themes that we're looking at throughout Luke Acts. These are the things that Luke really wants to communicate, and he does it again and again and again in every passage. Um, and so we owe it to Luke, and we owe it to the Holy Spirit who spoke through him to make sure that we attend to these, that we're really watching for these themes uh, and, and seeing them in each passage. So let's, um, let's start with our, our questions here. And uh, the title of the lesson is John Begins His Ministry and Jesus Prepares for His Own. So how does Luke show the passing of time and set this passage, uh, this narrative, in its larger historical context? And uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 really are, uh, give us the answer to that question uh, where, where Luke writes, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ituria and uh, Trachonitis and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And, and so, um, Luke tells us very clearly time has passed since there went out a decree um, because he's putting it in that larger context um, uh, of being part of the Roman Empire. This is not just the story of what's happening in this little corner of the world, but this is actually part of this cosmopolitan, cosmos, right, the universe, politas, the city, the, uh, the, the body politic, right, cosmopolitan, this cosmopolitan, this universal um, world in which this story is taking place. And, and then I asked the question, Luke chapter 3 verse 2 recalls what stories from the Old Testament. So, so the word of God came to John, uh, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And it really reminds us of two categories of things. First and foremost, in the wilderness, right? Well, the wilderness, right? That's the exodus, the, the wandering in the wilderness. Uh, this, so it, it is reminding us that this story ties to God's liberation of the people in which they were not entirely faithful to God. Uh, and it also reminds us of the, of the exile that was also understood as a kind of wilderness experience. And it also reminds us the word of God came to uh, that is very commonly how the prophetic books introduce God speaking to and through prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, uh, is God, the word of God came to. So we're linking both with the Exodus and exile experiences, and we're also linking to the prophetic tradition. Um, it foreshadows what event in Jesus' life is right around the corner. Well, uh, John is in the wilderness in chapter three, verse one and, and uh, following. And in chapter four, uh, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and led by the Spirit for 40 days in the wilderness. So it actually foreshadows what's about to happen with Jesus, that Jesus is going to have his own wilderness experience. Um, the next question we've addressed, what explicit connection does Luke draw between John and the prophets of old, right? And then um, how does that quote uh, highlight, this quote in verse four, um, highlight Luke's themes? So there's this, there's a quote from the book of Isaiah, 
uh, in verses four and following. So let's let me read that and let's think about uh, have your little have your little chart chart in front of you and think about how this quote highlights these themes. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So let's let's think about our our themes here. So um, big theme, big sort of super theme, God shows faithfulness and restores his people Israel. Okay, under that there's prophecy and Moses fulfilled. Well, boom, this, this, this is that passage being fulfilled, Luke says explicitly. The mission to the Gentiles. Well, it says in verse six, all flesh shall see the salvation of God, not just not just the chosen people, but all flesh. Right? Activity of the Holy Spirit. Um, well, earlier, right, it said that the word of God came to John. And that is always through the activity of the Holy Spirit. And again, if you know the prophets, you know that very often the phrase is the spirit of the Lord came upon. For example, Samson, one of the judges, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he did those mighty deeds. And then reversal of the world's order. Wow. Wow. Um, Trisha, Trisha jumped right on this. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low, crooked shall be made straight, rough ways made smooth, right? So, so even the geography and the geology is going to be changed. It's so, um, it's so dramatic and foundational, a reversal of the way the world is. Then let's also think about um, the second sort of super theme, which is God's restored Israel shows faithfulness to God, right? So the first is proclamation, right? Well, John is that voice crying in the wilderness. He is proclamation. And then let's, uh, let's hold on to the other themes until we move into to, to, uh, learning more about John's ministry. Um, and uh, so let's look at uh, let's look at that at his at his message, right? He's I love this. You brood of vipers, he says in in verse seven, right? Um, Bear fruits that befit repentance. Do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones, right? Judgment is a coming. And the multitudes ask him what they should do, and and he says, the one who has two coats should share with him who has none, the one who has food to do the same. Tax collectors want to uh, come wanting to be baptized and they ask the same question. And he says, well, don't, uh, don't rook people out of extra money. Um, only, only take what you're supposed to. And, um, and the soldiers, 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 those are probably Roman soldiers, maybe temple soldiers too, but um, so there may be some Gentiles here. Uh, saying, well, what should we do? And, and, and uh, John says, well, don't rob anyone. So don't, don't use your, uh, your status as a soldier to extort money out of people and beat money out of people. So very much so looking at our super themes, wow, sharing of possessions, really, really central. Um, and um, To what to what uh, to what Luke is is showing John is already uh, showing about how a faithful Israel responds to God and the fact that people are responding even even soldiers responding faithfully is telling us that God is about the work of restoring Israel God is being faithful so um, so then there's a phrase in um, in Luke chapter three verse fifteen that reminds us of Luke's theme of open-endedness and expectation. So let me read that verse. As the people were in expectation, and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ. So the, the verse explicitly says the people are, are expectant. And it also shows them asking questions about what is coming. They're not just stuck in where they are. They're not stuck in the past. They are looking at what God is doing in the 
in the now and in the future. Um, so, so they are, are expectant. And we reviewed, of course, who has been expectant for the previous two chapters. Elizabeth expecting John the Baptist, Mary expecting Jesus, Anna and Simeon expecting um, the consolation of Israel. Uh, so so I'll, that, that, that theme of expectation and being open to what God is, is doing next, um, really central right from the beginning. And we see it continued in this passage. Um, and then, then we look on at chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, and, and ask the question, in what respects does that passage prophesy about Jesus or foreshadow things about Jesus? So let's just read that, um, chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. So with many other exhortations, he, John, preached the good news to the people, but Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he shut up John in prison. So very obviously, it, um, it, it foreshadows Jesus' own confrontation with the authorities, and it, and it foreshadows the preaching of good news. And it is that that very preaching proclamation, just like right proclamation. That's what faithful Israel, faithful followers of God do, is we proclaim. And it got John in trouble. It got Jesus in trouble. <laughs> Excuse me. And it shouldn't surprise anybody that it sometimes gets the church in trouble. So that foreshadows Jesus. Then in verse twenty-one and twenty-two. Um, Luke is going to pivot his attention to Jesus away from John. Now, when all the people were baptized and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove. And a voice came from heaven. Thou art my beloved son. With thee, I am well pleased. Um, so uh, right here, we're seeing the activity of the Holy Spirit. Um, um, and we're also seeing... Jesus fulfill one of the things in our chart. What does faithful Israel do? It says here, Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. So one of the things that Luke really highlights is the life, the prayer life of the church. And included in that is the prayer life of Jesus. Um, more than any of the other gospel writers, Luke really pays attention to Jesus' prayer life. Um, so, so we're now pivoting uh, our attention to Jesus. All of a sudden, there's this genealogy, and most everybody uh, who reads a biblical genealogy does this, right? Okay, we're not going to do that, but we're also not going to bog down. It's here for a reason. Um, it's here to tie Jesus, first of all, to David, right? We see in um, in verse thirty one, the son of 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 Nathan, the son of David. So we're very clearly identifying Jesus as a son of David, and and as here to fulfill the Davidic covenant, the promise to David that he would have an heir that would sit upon an eternal throne, that David's David's throne would never end. So we're seeing a reminder that this is a fulfillment of one of God's promises. We're also tying him uh, further back, of course, to Abraham. And that, of course, is a reminder. God is being faithful to his promises to Abraham, that through him, right, God is going to bless, going to, going to get, have many children, right, many descendants. We, of course, as Christians say that Abraham is our father in faith. And it's also a reminder that that uh, that covenant with Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, back in the twelfth chapter of Genesis. Let's turn there. Back in the twelfth chapter of Genesis, it's one of those passages that everybody should know how to find. The promise to Abraham is the twelfth chapter of Genesis. In the third verse, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. So rooting the salvation of the Gentiles 
in the original Abrahamic promise, reminding us that's nothing new. God has always intended for the chosen people to be an instrument of salvation to the world. And that that's our model for ourselves. We are not saved for ourselves. We are saved for others, to serve others. Um, and then Luke does something that Matthew does not do with his genealogy, right? Luke takes it all the way back to Adam. So that Jesus, yes, he is the son of Abraham, but he is also a son of Adam, just like all of us. He is not just Abraham's representative, not just Abraham's fulfillment, but he is in fact Adam's fulfillment in the sense that he is going to be what Adam was supposed to be in the first place, um, a model human. Um, and, that, and then that reminder, that connection, the son of God. Uh, so, so we're reminded uh, at the baptism <clears throat> that he is spiritually God's son, and we're reminded through the genealogy that he is uh, genealogically um, the son of God the, the, as, as he has descended from Adam, right? Um, and then Jesus in chapter four, full of the Holy Spirit, goes out into the wilderness. And we've already said that that um, recalls the experience of the Exodus most profoundly. And of course, how did the children of Israel for the most part act in the wilderness? Right, they, they grumbled, they murmured. That's the, the verb used again and again, they murmur, um, which is that wonderful onomatopoetic word, murmur, 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 murmur. Uh, it sounds like what it is. Um, and, and they are tempted they're hungry, they demand bread, uh, they demand water, they demand meat. Um, we want, we want, we want. Um, they, they, they don't do very well. And that's no judgment against them because we would all be doing the same thing um, in their shoes. Jesus, on the other hand, goes into the wilderness and he's hungry, but he passes the test. He is tempted. Uh, the devil comes to him, turn these stones into bread. He won't do it. And it's not because he, he doesn't want to use his powers to turn, to, to, to miraculously create bread, right? In just a few chapters, he's going to do that for the multitude. Um, but he's not going to do it for himself. And um, so Jesus performs very differently in the wilderness um, than, than all of the rest of the children of Israel have ever done. All the rest of us as human beings have ever done. He fulfills what God intended. And that is um, to live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And it's important to note, um, Jesus doesn't just make up his own answers, right? Um, he, he turns to scripture, right? Law fulfilled. Um, he lives up to the word of God that has been around for quite a long time. He lives up to it um, in a way that we don't. Um, and, and notice that for Luke, for Luke, um, the culmination here of the temptations uh, is which of the temptations, right? Bread comes first, and then what comes next? Right, the 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 temptation to rule all the nations. And then the last temptation is, is to throw himself down from the temple. And, and so um, I want to show you something. Hold on a second. I'm going to show you something. This is a great opportunity to look at Luke using his sources. Um, this is a book, Gospel Parallels, um, by, uh, it's been around a long time. When did the the guy who edited this has a very, the very unfortunate name of, um, shoot, it's really unfortunate. It's Throckmorton, bless his heart, Jr. Burton H. Throckmorton, Jr. <laughs> he, um, he compiled this uh, for the first time in 1949, last edition was in 67. And, and and it's a it's gospel parallels. 
So it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're all running next to each other in columns. Tilt this so we can see a little better. And so that's, this is Matthew, this is Mark, this is Luke, Matthew, Mark, that empty column there, Luke. So what he did was pull passages next to each other um, that are parallel passages. So first, let's look at the temptation in Mark. I'm going to read it for you. The spirit immediately drove him, Jesus, out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. That's it. That's the whole temptation of Christ in the wilderness by Mark. So that few, few verses there, and then see this empty column here. Mark does not develop it at all. Matthew does. Luke does. It's the same threefold temptation in both Matthew and Luke, but it doesn't appear. Those sayings don't appear in Mark. So that means it's from which of the sources? Is it from, from Mark, the spine that gives us the narrative spine? Is it from special Luke? That means it's only in Luke, or is it in Q, which is material that's in both Luke and Matthew, but not in Mark, right? It's from Q because it appears, it appears both in, I'm trying to get this for you. It's in Matthew, that's Matthew, that's Matthew, and it's in Luke, it's in Luke, right? And it's different. In Matthew, the, the ultimate temptation, the third temptation, is worldly power. The temple is second. In Luke, the temple is third. The temple is the ultimate temptation. So for Luke, that's, that's the big one. That's that's the, woo, can he withstand this? And so very clearly for Luke, the temple is important. And we're going to see that again and again and again. The reason it's so important, right, is because for Luke, it's so important to show that God is being faithful to his promises. Um, we, we looked at this in our course on Here I Will Dwell, right? God talks about the temple is where he's going to dwell with his people. Well, is he going to do it or not? Um, and for Luke, it's important to say, yes, yes, God is going to be faithful to that through Jesus, but not the way the devil is suggesting, not by a big show, not by seizing power, not by, you know, technicolor special effects, right? It's, it's going to be a very different kind of faithfulness to his prophet, to his prophecies, to his promises. Not by throwing himself down off the temple and not, you know, and then flying off like Superman. Um, Jesus weathers this trial brilliantly um, and, and the devil departs. And notice, um, notice that even this passage has an open-ended conclusion. In verse 13 of chapter four, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Uh, Luke is telling us that, that Jesus' confrontation with temptation is not over. Uh, it's again, it's a beautiful example of the open-endedness of the narrative. Uh, he's, he's, he's given us a little preview. Jesus, Jesus has tough row ahead um, that is going to include temptation. Uh, and presumably that that speaks to our situation as well. Um, so, I hope that gives you um, an overview of what we did on Sunday, a recap, and helps you reinforce these themes, these themes, right? Um, and then this coming Sunday will be in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through chapter 5, verse 16. I want you to really pay attention to your themes. We're going to really get down and dirty with those. Um, 
And just as a reminder, um, Luke quoted from the book of Isaiah in today's passage. And he's going to quote from Isaiah again this coming Sunday. Luke hardly ever directly quotes. He hardly ever says, I'm now quoting from such and so. Matthew does that all the time. All the time. Luke prefers to just weave it in, um, allude to it, suggest it, um, echo it. But he very, very rarely has uh, explicit. And now I am quoting from this prophet. He's going to do it. He did it today. And he's going to do it again next week. And that should be neon signs that that's super important. So um, stay tuned as we continue in the life and ministry of Jesus. So go forth in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.